Well, welcome to the 48th episode of Silver Lining for Learning. This is a great opportunity for us to do something different because we are virtually uh, a session at the Computers and Education Society of Ireland Conference, uh, the closing session. And <clears throat> all of us are gonna be sharing some of our favorite episodes out of the 48 with the conferees of the conference and then uh, taking questions and, and comments that they want to make. I want to introduce uh, Dermot Walsh, who is going to be the moderator once we get to the Q&A. Dermot, uh, will you introduce yourselves to the rest of our audience? So thank you very much, Chris. Um, as Chris said, my name is Dermot Walsh and I will be moderating this uh, discussion. And I'm representing SESI, the Computers and Education Society of Ireland. We're very glad to be here and, and thank you so much for joining our conference and for helping us to close out the session with such internationally renowned um, academics. So I'll hang on, I'll hand over to Jan. All right, thanks, uh, Dermot. And uh, Chris, can you share the slides? Thank you. Well, this is a great opportunity for us to interact with uh, our uh, colleagues in Ireland. And we started the uh, silver lining in March last year. And with the thoughts that uh, we would be able to bring in innovative thinking, new possibilities uh, that can happen during the COVID. And we did not realize, you know, uh, after almost a year now, we're still running the show. This is uh, uh, quite uh, interesting. So how it started, it's very simple. I, I sent an email to, uh, uh, to Chris Didi uh, of Harvard, to Kurt Bunk of Indiana University, to Punia Mishra of Arizona State University, and uh, uh, Scott McLeod of uh, University of Colorado, as well as we connected with Shuang Ye Chen from uh, uh, China. He's, East China Normal University. And we talked a little bit about uh, having a show. So we tested our ideas and we decided we want to do it. So we've been doing this for the last year and we'll continue to do this. And now of course the ideas we have interacted with are really rich and it shows the power of technology in driving educational changes as well as using technology to support educational changes. So watch us, silverliningforlearning.org, or you can watch our uh, YouTube recordings uh, uh, afterwards. So uh, Chris, can we go to the next slide? And for this session, uh, I think it's out of uh, a group of discussion, uh, especially Chris suggested that uh, we want to focus, each one of our hosts will focus on really three episodes. We picked three episodes to see what we have learned most, what we have done, what we have learned. So here are my uh, three episodes. My three episodes are really based on the idea of uh, student as partners of change, student as owners of learning. Chris, can we uh, move on to the next slide? So uh, the, the first uh, one I picked is really um, a paradigm shift by uh, Dr. Stephen Harris from Australia, but he actually works in, uh, in Barcelona, in Spain. And the, his big thing is about how do we in, enable students to take charge of their own learning. And he's working for something, an organization called Learn Life, which really is a mixture of uh, young children, adults together. And, but a lot of the times is the students are driving their own learning. And that is a very, very strong um, message we want to uh, pass on. And because during COVID, as you know, learning has been disrupted. A lot of schools have done a lot of remote learning. And, but we think this might be a new possibility where students, when they take charge, when they are supported by teachers, when they are in that different environments, they may become more creative, more responsible, more confident for their learning. And that comes to my 
next episode, which uh, we invited, uh, Chris can, yeah, we invited students early, early on in our episode from uh, Beijing, from Hawaii, and from Sydney. These are the K-12 school students, as young as, you know, seventh graders, talking about how their schools have enabled them to work on their own projects. It's kind of like a passion project. It's instead of remote learning or forcing them to do remote learning, just listening to classes, but these students have done authentic projects. These students, I really hope encourage you to watch it. It's episode 15. You will see these students, how confident they are, how responsible they are and how creative uh, they are. They have uh, uh, completed projects, uh, big ones, small ones, but also they have learned to manage themselves. And that's very significant. Can I come to the next one, uh, episode? Chris? So the last one I want to share with you is uh, episode 35, where we see an organization. It's called the Global Online Academy, where it's a, it's a membership organization with over 200 schools across the globe. And their students are taking classes in this Global Online Academy. And those classes can be counted as credits toward own schools. Now, this is an amazing thing for me because number one, it presents a new possibility for students learn globally. Number two, it challenges the existing schools, wherever you are, you might be in Ireland, in Dublin, in Cork, or wherever you are, is to say your students can learn globally with others. But that learning should be counted as learning in your own place. So that means their schools have to agree to each other to say, yes, your offering is as good as my offer, my offering is as good as yours. And the Global Online Academy also provides opportunities for professional development of teachers. And these teachers can also offer courses to students in other places. I think this might be a new type of organization, honestly, in the future. It's, it's possible that educational institutions might change in many different ways. So to summarize, you know, there, there's uh, what I've been saying this is uh, broadening learning opportunities for students, enabling them to manage and become owners of their own learning and to expand students' experiences globally. I think technology, that's where technology can do. That's what uh, technology can help. Uh, thank you. Ponya? Yes. All right. The famous thing of forgetting to unmute. So uh, thank you, uh, Zhao, for that. And thank you all for inviting us uh, to this session today. Um, the three uh, stories that I have uh, chosen to select uh, sort of build on some of the things that Zhao talked about, but also take it in a slightly different direction. Uh, so there is this emphasis on global education and this idea of extended classrooms, because if you think about within uh, two months, uh, the numbers are staggering, like 97% you know, of all learners were out of school. And so the question I sort of asked myself, what is interesting to me is which systems were resilient, which schools or institutions managed to uh, sort of not just, you know, sort of put their heads in the sand, but really move forward. So these are the three stories that I wanted to share. So uh, next slide, please. So the first one is uh, Sean Lesher uh, from the Urban Discovery Schools, an amazing episode. It's an inner city K-12 school in uh, San Diego. And one of the things that Sean has managed to do in this, uh, in this organization is bring a very active action research design oriented approach to the work that they do. Um, interestingly, all schools in California were declared closed uh, starting Friday, the 13th of March. Uh, Friday the 13th, it seems sort of perfect. And the uh, only school that was ready and up and running on Monday was uh, the Urban Discovery Schools. And that to me is very interesting as to uh, how 
this organization was prepared for something like this, even though they didn't know a pandemic would be coming. And I'll talk a little bit more about sort of overall lessons. Could I get the next slide, please? The second one I want to share is episode number 43, which is, uh, and I specifically want to talk about the person on the left, Kiran Bir Sethi. Um, she was not trained as an educator, uh, was very disappointed when her kid went to school for the first time and decided to take matter in her own hands and 20 years ago started the Riverside School in Ahmedabad in India. And that's a completely different context from an urban school in San Diego, but what is amazing are the similarities between these two individuals or the approaches that they took, which is they saw their work as a design process, which you prototype, you try, you listen. You know, one of the things that comes across very clearly, both from uh, Sean's work and, Bo and from Kiran's work is that is listening to the children. And it's kind of interesting because if you think about it, um, even though schools and educational systems, we talk about learner centered and so on, it is always us deciding for them what they think is important. But this broader sort of understanding that children come in with talents and interests and passions and they want to do good, they want to do well, and that we as educators have to channel that. Um, and the final one that I wanted to share, which is slightly different, this is uh, an episode and and Kurt will talk more about that because he's actually doing some research on this right now. Um, but what was amazing about that episode is these kids who are in really impoverished context because of the pandemic um, or even without the pandemic managed to sort of uh, um, get access to these MOOCs, these massively open online courses and initially started out wanting to you know, mostly to learn English or somebody who was 10 years old wanting to learn programming. And what's fascinating is that this opportunity gave them a chance to expand. And I have some quotes from them, you know, that I intended to use Coursera for developing my writing skills. Then I discovered about mythologies and culture and now is really into writing and Greek and Egyptian history. A 13 year old girl uh, who described her school as being in a forest and says that it opened a whole new world of learning. I was inside a bubble in which learning was limited to the subjects that were taught in our school, but that course has inspired me to learn, you know, so on and so forth, right? And so these three to me speak to some bigger issues around how we think about systems and culture and that what Kiran and what uh, Sean have done. And I think in the case of Nepal, one educator there, uh, Bauman Dhimre, who was also a guest on the show, has managed to do is create these opportunities for learners to be, to achieve their full potential. But that requires us to think about the broader design of the systems and culture, which sort of goes back to some of the points that Young was making. The other thing that stands out really in this, that these sort of the values and morals and the ethical role that, you know, that we play as educators. Something that really stood out when Sean spoke, uh, when uh, Kiran spoke, is that we are always trying to reach out to the ones who are most in need. So one of the things that Sean School, for instance, the first thing that, it, that we put an emphasis not on the ones who have access to the technology, but the ones who do not. Because the ones who have access, they have the support, they have the technology. How do we reach the ones who are most in need, whether they be special education students, whether they be second language learners and so on. Another piece is this piece around design. And it's interesting, both Kiran and Sean talked about the role of a desk. Sean talked about what is the meaning where a teacher's desk is in a classroom. If it is in the front, if it is on the side, what kind of symbolic meaning does it send to the kids? And Kiran talked about that she talks to a lot of principals who say, oh, I would like to have a flat organization. Then she says, get out of your office and put your desk in the corridor, be in the middle of the action. And I think this is what leads to creative ideas. This is what leads to listening to people and coming up with these solutions. Finally, relationships are critical, developing them, understanding them, nurturing them, and a culture of caring, which you talk not just of your students, but also of the families and the broader community and context within which this works. So I think those are sort of the themes that sort of really stood out to me, not just from these episodes, from other ones as well, but these were three I felt that were uh, worthwhile to share, that how can we think of systems and culture that allow for learners to achieve their full potential? And I think these three sort of examples speak to that. Kurt, I will pass it on to you.
I did mute myself. Thank you, Punya. Thank you, Chris. And thank you, Young. We're delighted to be here today uh, to have the capstone session. Uh, Chris, we'll go back just one slide. And, you know, uh, when I had a chance to meet, virtually meet Bay Bayman and Bishwa, and they wrote a chapter for my last book, uh, MOOCs and Open Education in the, in the Global South, uh, this past year, uh, they said, there's really something fascinating happening here. We're scaling English teaching uh, through MOOCs um, around the world, having kids learn English and then share their experiences with other kids in other high schools. Now, Bayman's at Motherland uh, High School in Nepal. Uh, Bishwa is with the US consulate in charge of getting English taught. And these kids were taking these MOOCs from Harvard and uh, Stanford and Berkeley and other places to get prepped for college, to get ready for college. And I had been studying self-directed learning in MOOCs because I have a database of, of, of MOOC instructors and I'm interested in, the, in, in this notion. That when we started probing these kids, it's just fascinating. As Punya said, they're learning paleontology and Egyptian culture and all sorts of other things in addition to English. And when the parents were coming home from, from work, you know, they were worried about their kids at home during the pandemic because they had gone in Nepal from I think 55% to 70% internet access in the past couple of years. And they're seeing the kids on the internet all the time. And they're asking, hey, what are, what are you doing? They're, they're worried the kids were playing games. And what they were doing is getting certificates from Harvard and, and Berkeley and other places. And so, you know, that was really a fascinating episode to hear these individual stories. And so I encourage you to watch that, that episode because it's really student driven. Um, middle school and high school kids uh, learning English and, and many other things. So Chris, if you could fast forward to my three, um, the first one of the three that I selected of our episodes, and by the way, all three of the episodes I selected were environmental episodes in some way or marine biology in some way. Um, and the first one was really um, spearheaded by Marianne Krasny of Cornell University, where Marianne has creating STEM courses as MOOCs and creating MOOCs for a cause getting instructors, teachers, and students in local communities implementing some of the ideas from the courses that are being taught in, in uh, those STEM areas, environmental education in particular. And so she has Father Massey in Zimbabwe and Michael in South Africa and people in Iran and in, in China and the Bahamas uh, and uh, Colombia, South America, all banded together taking the ideas that are taught globally in global education and implementing them locally and sharing the experiences and, and what happened. And she also has a chapter in my MOOCs and Open Ed in the Global South book. And so if you wanna read more, just send me an email and I'm happy to share either of those two chapters if they struck a chord with you. Uh, next one, Chris. And so the second one I picked out here is someone I've known for over about 15 years, Cassandra Brooks. And I first met her when she was a master's student in California and she, was, she had just landed in Antarctica and was studying the Antarctic toothfish. Uh, we all know it as the Chilean sea bass on the, rest, on the restaurant menus. She also was studying the krill as a master's student and she, just happened to be in the right place at the right time and her career has exploded. Now she's a, she's a professor at the University of Colorado at Boulder teaching um, marine biology and um, doing actually courses on media related uh, to marine biology and, and other things, um, policy courses and so forth. I just subbed in in one of her classes in fact. And so um, he first, when I met her, she was working for the Exploratorium in San Francisco as the ice stories projects uploading a blog a day and kids around the world in schools would ask her questions about her research at 11 o'clock at night when they had the one hour of internet access. So it was really a story of adventure learning in, in many ways. And if you have a chance to look up Cassandra Brooks and type in stop motion videos and she's got a great stop motion video that CNN picked up and has had 800,000 viewers and so forth. But she's now trying to save the last ocean and she's part of the last you can type in last ocean project uh, and what's being done there to, to um, preserve uh, vast areas of the Antarctic. It's really fascinating work but again a lot of this has to do with global education and as Punya said extended classrooms extending beyond your four walls 
to the real world, to, to get the students involved in real world ideas and authentic learning. I think going to the next slide, Chris. Um, the third one is, is just, in fact, an extension of that extended learning. My friend uh, Jenny Pennycook studies the, um, the Adoli penguin in Antarctica, not the emperor penguin. She's been down there for nearly 20 years, I think 15, 16, 17 years, not this year because of COVID. She's a former teacher from Fresno, California, still lives in Fresno, and sends her work at, um, from the penguin cams that she has down in Antarctica to schools. And she has a number of critical thinking and creative thinking um, curriculum wrapped around her daily observations of these penguins. And she has these um, cameras and uh, videos and text and all sorts of information she uploads and makes available for the students to do problem solving activities, problem-based learning activities and all sorts of things. So she's extending the classrooms um, to the, as far as you can go, in fact. And so it's really fascinating to see the kids taking and asking, taking those data and asking questions and making their predictions and making their observations and getting excited about science. And so again, all three of those episodes can involve some sense of extending in classroom, reflection, active learning, engaging learning, questioning, and so forth. The higher order thinking skills that we all talk about. What's interesting is the web enables us to do that. Just like us coming in here today, you can bring in anybody at any time from around the world. Today, anyone can learn anything from anyone else at any time. The, I have a book called The World is Open, which kind of gets at that premise. Um, so I, I'll end there, Chris, and we'll come back, I'm sure, to some of these ideas. So again, we really appreciate being invited to share ideas. I'll go through my episodes fairly quickly because all of us want to make sure that we have time for your comments and questions and dialogue with us. Uh, so the first episode I picked was from uh, Associate Dean at Stanford, Paul Kim. Uh, Paul has been an inspiration to me over the couple decades that I've known him. And in this episode, there were two things in particular that stood out. One of them is that he's developed an infrastructure for schools in any country, but particularly low resource schools in the global south or low resource schools in the developed world where for $35, you can purchase a box and that box is a Raspberry Pi server. And so it's a computer, it's a server, it's a wireless hub, it's a uh, considerable archive of digital materials, uh, many gigabytes of digital materials. And it can be set up in a single classroom and then students can rotate in and out just as we used to do in the US for computer labs. And they can interact with a very wide variety of materials, the whole school for $35. So we, we no longer need to really think about scarcity in terms of powerful technologies for students anywhere in the world if we're creative about that. But of course, technology is never the innovation. Technology is a catalyst for deeper content, more active forms of learning, more authentic forms of assessment, links between school and life, but it's never the innovation in itself. And so Paul talked about an innovation that he's developed called teaching students to ask great questions. Now, I think a lot about using technology not to do things better, to kind of automate with technology what we're already doing, but doing better things to transform education using technology as a catalyst. And I think this is a nice example because teaching students to ask great questions cross, cuts across every part of the curriculum, but it's not a part of any part of the curriculum now. It's active learning. It gives students a sense of agency and relevance. It involves critical thinking. So there's just a lot of, metacognition. There's a lot going on here, and I urge you to take a look at that episode as an example of really creative thinking about doing better things. Uh, a second episode um, that I really 
learned a lot from uh, was about fan fiction and the large peer communities of students who were writing and helping each other to improve fan fiction. For example, the Harry Potter fan fiction community in its many forms. And two uh, faculty members who have studied this were our guest experts. And uh, Cecilia in particular talked about in her childhood, she had uh, been discriminated against in many ways as a woman of color. She had turned to literature and gotten all excited about Lord of the Rings, uh, Tolkien's enormous uh, three volume series, but she'd been dismayed by how male centric Lord of the Rings is. And so in, in middle school, she rewrote Lord of the Rings uh, to, to have proper female characters represented in it, which is just an amazing thing to do. And what they talked about and what I've seen in, in other settings uh, is that many people have never seen themselves in a piece of literature that they've been taught in academics. They've never seen themselves in a mainstream movie in terms of who they are. And then somebody like Tim Burton comes out with The Night Bear Before Christmas, and he got a lot of fan mail from people who said, for the first time, I see myself in a movie that I'm legitimate, that I'm a person, that even though I'm different. And so I think this episode both gets at peer-based communities of, of creation. And, and we could have done one on the making community as well, perhaps we will. And at this idea of inclusion through creating your own literature, your own art, your own forms of expression that provide legitimacy for who you are and your identity. And then the third, um, actually Tokes Bakari, who was a, a kind of a guest expert as a, as a moderator and commentator, uh, was a master's student with me. She's now a teaching fellow for my course this spring after graduating. She involved a couple people that she knew in Africa. And these are people that are working in very low resource schools uh, with particularly with girls who were marginalized in a lot of the, the cultures and, and helping them to use immersive media like virtual reality. And what that underscores is that we not only have deficit models in terms of people who have been marginalized by society being seen as inferior when actually they have tremendous strengths that they bring, but we also have deficit models in terms of saying, well, schools like that just need to use simple technologies and do remedial kinds of work. When in fact, with modern cell phones, we can do immersive learning. And they demonstrated how you were beginning to be able to do immersive learning so that these schools can leapfrog a lot of what's happening in industrial era education. So I really found those three episodes evocative, but I also want to just talk for a second before we go into questions about stepping back from the trees of these individual episodes and looking at the whole forest of silver lining for learning. One of the things I think has struck all of us is how many of these projects were unknown. They, they might have been known to one of us, but they certainly weren't known to all of us. And they certainly are not known to the ed tech community writ large. Uh, what we share in our field is the kinds of things that get into scholarly journals or the kinds of people who have the resources to come to professional conferences. And these individuals heroes who are taking advantage of the disruption from the pandemic that has undercut the dead hand of the past and undercut the compliance mentality of the present and allowed bottom-up innovation. These are, are relatively unknown. And I think this archive, this growing archive of silver lining for learning 
is a very valuable resource for anybody who's teaching in the field. It's a valuable resource for people who are thinking of designing things, uh, who, are, who are entrepreneurs who want to start a company and develop something powerful and scale it up. Because all of those lessons are captured here in, in really interesting and powerful ways. So we're all excited about Silver Lining for Learning. We hope that we've communicated that excitement to you. And I want to turn it over to Dermot now for the rest of the time so that we can dialogue with you about what we've said or other things you want to bring up. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, it's very, very interesting to see the topics that you have discussed and particularly the ones that you have all chosen. I'm just trying to make a few notes here as you've been going along. And there's a couple of things that have struck me and maybe the, the last item you talked about there, Chris, was bottom-up innovation. Um, you've also all mentioned uh, change, transformation, um, ownership, moving ownership over to the learner. Is bottom-up, is this the quickest way of achieving transformational change in education? Uh, but if you're asking me, I would say, Probably yes, because my, my research, my writing has a lot to do with uh, how we have not involved students in determining what they want to learn, how they want to learn, where they want to learn. But that's precisely what technology has been arguing for to say, yeah, we need to, technology can enable students to have access to resources to determine that. But why would they do that if schools control them too much? So that's where I think, yes, I think liberating the students, enable them to own their learning and build education based on their strength and their passion would be the way to go. In my teaching, I talk about three models of change, evolution, transformation, and disruption. And most of us spend our time on evolution, trying to change a system maybe 10% every year. And what we've seen repeatedly is that the tide comes in and washes the sandcastle away once you get to about the 20 or 30% level when the traditional system feels threatened and fights back. Transformation is where you say, okay, I'm going to bring in a charismatic leader. We're gonna change you know, 40, 50% of the system at once. And then there's a war between the old system and the new system. And sometimes the new one wins and sometimes the old one wins, but, but everybody is sort of traumatized by it and it's a difficult. So my colleague, Clay Christensen at Harvard talked about disruption. The idea that you build something outside of the system that serves people who are ill served by the traditional system and then as you get better and better and better, the old system erodes as people vote with their feet to come into the new system. We see this all the time in technology where you know, the, the desktop computers undercut the, the mid-frame, mainframe computers, and then the mobile phones and devices are undercutting the desktop computers. But it, it can work in education as well. And I think many of these episodes are the seeds of disruption if we are clever about how we scale them. So um, if I can just build on that. So one of the things that you know I have really gotten interested in, uh, I used to work a lot with teachers and educators and realize that, that they're entering back into a system which actually constrains them despite their best effort, despite their best interests and so on. And I think that one of the things that I'm increasingly coming to understand and realize and appreciate is, which is why I chose two of those examples, is the critical role that leadership plays within these organizations. And the critical role that sort of bringing an ethical and a moral compass that really cares about the people, what they really want and need, and not be driven and determined by existing, I mean, all many of our guests speak to this question of questioning the fundamental assumptions that we just have taken for granted. And I think if COVID-19 has done one thing, it has sort of uprooted a lot of these assumptions about the separation between let's say school and, and home, because suddenly now your home, your school, 
is melded together. You can see that as a positive, you can see that as a problem. But the fact of the matter is that we have for too long created these structures and organizations where you are supposed to go in at a certain time, learn and then leave for a certain time, for a certain number of years. That learning is something that is integral to your individual development as a member of your family, as a member of the community, as a member of the nation, as a member of the globe. Those are the kinds of questions we haven't asked ourselves. And so I think one of the biggest things, I think people who are doing this disruptive work understand that all of this stuff is made up. We made this stuff up. This is not a natural thing like a rock or a cloud or a, or a proton, right? And that if we, once we accept the fact that this stuff is all made up, we can go and make whatever we want to out of it and driven by a deeper sort of a values driven conversation, which we often don't have in education. We ended up, we end up often talking about process, not about why we are here in the first place. And I think most, in fact, I think all of our guests perpetually are asking themselves, why am I doing this? <laughs> What's the purpose of this? And I think that's, if you have to have change, I think that becomes an integral question that we have to keep asking ourselves. I think my colleagues have answered the question satisfactorily, but I'll just add uh, the point that incremental change will not get us to where we need to be, as Chris pointed out. And when I wrote my World is Open book, I actually had to cut half of it out and I was going to try and create a free book called The World is More Open. I'm now working on the idea of the world is wide open. And that's interviewing people around the world whose lives have changed through technology. And I think what Chris mentioned that, uh, that what we've done in Silver Line for Learning is made people aware of things that are happening around the globe that maybe people haven't been aware of. And that's my next project is trying to assemble those things together so that um, people can make that leap in awareness and actually from awareness to doing something and sharing and advocacy and so forth. We've been stuck between the stages of awareness and resistance for too long. And so anyways, um, Dermot, I'll let you go on to your second question. Yeah, so that's, 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 a, that's very interesting. Um, it's, I suppose it, it sounds very much like a kind of a, a critical examination of the way the systems and the way the structures have been erected. Um, Punya, you mentioned that it was all made up. I'm a school leader. I guess you guys are teachers yourselves. And Punya, you mentioned that you were heavily involved in teacher education. So there's a bit of a conflict of interest there, isn't it? In the sense that the people who are guiding the structures, the people who are guiding the system are also the ones who are trying to change the system. But yet, I guess we have demands on us where we have to go to school, we have to set up the school. There are external and internal elements towards change. Could you elaborate on those, Punya? Or maybe external and internal processes that either so, facilitate or construe so, change? Well, I, you know, one of the things that there is one of the tropes in educational technology is that, oh, look at every field of human activity, right? From medicine to music to the arts have been dramatically changed by technology. Why has schooling remained the same, right? Why does, you know, this is like a classic even though I don't not necessarily sure it's 100% true, but you could go back 100 years, look at a classroom, look at a classroom now, they look sort of similar, right? And I think that part of the reason why that is the case is that education is, is at the intersection of lots of other systems. So there are assessment systems, there are policy systems, all of these structures. And so if you want to make a change in one thing, you have all these other network effects which are actually holding you down. Right, and so there are there are different strategies towards it. So Chris uh, talked about that you try to create something completely in parallel and let that grow and nurture, and that may be the example that Xiao shared with the Global Learning Academy, which is saying, "Hey, we are going to make this network of schools where kids can take classes, irrespective of where they are, as long as we have some way of transferring a certificate and saying yes." you completed X, that it requires trust among these organizations and so on, right? Other example would be something like the two examples that I shared with the Riverside School and the Urban Discovery who are working within the system. They're saying, okay, we will do whatever we can within the system to do something special for our kids, the kids in our care or the families who we are working with and so on. So I think there are, 
there is a reason why the educational system is so conservative. There is there are a lot of economic, social, structural, historical legacy factors at work. But I think that the reason I sort of say that you know that this whole thing is made up because the whole thing is made up. You know, there is there is no natural kind of you know, out there in the world of what a school needs to be. A school doesn't need to be anything. A school can be anything that we can imagine it to be. You know, a, a learning uh, a context, a situation can be anything that we imagine it to be, right? And I think that's a vision that I think many of the guests on our show share. And yes, I work in it, you know, in a, in a university. There are constraints to what I can de- say, do, so on. But even within that, there always is wiggle room. I think that's one of the most important things to understand: is once you get a systems perspective of thing, you start realizing the amount of wiggle room you actually do have. Not everybody needs to be revolutionary, but you can make significant change within the context that you're in. I don't know if Chris, Zhao, Kurt, you have- Can I just questions? add just some one thing? I know we're running out of time. We got a lot of people have questions, but this is a very interesting question. I just want to highlight what Punya says that, you know, just reimagine the modern schools were created by some human beings and then other people have been copying it. And what's sad is that uh, even though we know more, poor countries, developed countries that are trying to copy schools, they still copy the old, outdated schools. So I think that I think it's a strong message. Uh, let's not be shy about once you know we created schools, we can undo schools. You know, I'm actually very. Uh, I, I would like to argue. I've been arguing to say reimagine education without schools. You know, can we reimagine education without schools? I think we can do that. And, uh, and it's possible and it can be done, but it takes people's time. So when people ask me to say, what do you think the future of education will be? I said, well, I'm not a weather forecast person. I, I, I can tell you, I don't know what's going to be, but I know what I would like it to be. So that's, I think we should take that attitude. I think one theme that's emerged in a lot of our episodes is adult unlearning, that our identities are caught up in a lot of aspects of industrial era education. And I'm including universities and and Harvard in in that assertion. And that it's hard to unlearn something where your identity and your emotions are caught up in being part of the old system. And yet it's essential if we're going to get to these new models. Very good. So, so we have a number of questions coming through from Ireland then as well. One is from John Heffernan, who, who was in contact with you um, previously. So I'll just read it out. Um, many might think of the pandemic's effect on education as a black swan event. If you were asked to bet on the next black swan event to have an impact on education, what would you be putting your money on? I can go. I, I, I would ask that question because I think the black swan by definition is that you don't know what it is going to be. What you do know is that there is going to be one, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's climate change, whether it is a financial disaster, global financial meltdown, we don't know what it is going to be. What we do know, given the complex, volatile uh, world that we live in, that there will be that. The question then becomes, how do you maintain resiliency And I think Chris, you have spoken about it as I was listening to the previous episodes quite eloquently about how organizations, many organizations just froze and shut down uh, when this COVID happened. While there were these other ones that we speak to in our examples, and we have many in our show who did it, who took, didn't, I mean, didn't necessarily see this as an opportunity. They were not trying to minimize the human scale of the devastation that was going on, but managed to, within that context, keeping their values intact, reaching out and trying to make do the best. So the question really for me is, can we develop resilient systems given that we do not know what the next black swan is going to be? Is it going to be AI in education? Is it going to be, I mean, I used to live in Michigan. I mean, that's the rust belt. I mean, you know, Kurt, you can speak to that. Like all these cities which were once flourishing communities, devastated, right? I mean, is it an effect of now? I mean, the, the, the interconnections, economic, social in this world are so complicated. 
that the point is not to predict what it will be, but I think be prepared for whatever it may be. How do you build agency, strength, resilience in your students, in your, in your staff, in your institutions, in your social structures to ride that storm? Because the storms are going to come. That's a given. And it, get, it gets into dispositions because something like resiliency is a disposition. It's not a skill. It's not a, a type of knowledge. It's not cognitive. It's, it's more complicated than that. And we don't, we don't include dispositions in our uh, outcomes in terms of what we'd like to, to create. And society doesn't uh, encourage us to do so. Can you imagine uh, somebody applying for a job and saying, I can document from my schooling that I can ask great questions, that I'm very innovative and that I'm very resilient. If I'm an employer, I want to hire that person on the spot. There's nothing in the educational system that's designed either to create that or document that, unless you get into some of the interesting kinds of new models that we're seeing in these episodes. Adrian asked you a question. Did we deal with any about UDL, Universal Design for Learning? Uh, no, we haven't. Uh, we, we could get someone. There's a group of people at the CAST and University of Kansas doing a good job in that area. My, my former student, Susie Grunstedt in the University of Houston has a new book on UDL and uh, I, I can connect you to her. Okay, thank you very much. There's a question that came through from one of our SOSI members. Um, I was just putting them up there. Um, I'll put it in the chat in, the, in YouTube in a second. Great. You know, a, a lot of the comments have to do, would we ever imagined all this happening? <laughs> you know, the answer is no. We've been living, how many years have we, uh, you know, have we seen so much resistance to the change? How many tomatoes have I gotten thrown at me when I've gone off to London and, and uh, Edinburgh and so forth? Uh, this, the, people stop throwing tomatoes though, all of a sudden, <laughs> you know? And, and you know, people start asking, what can we do? You know, this past summer it was like, can come on over, you know, virtually come on over and what can we do? What can we do? So um, I've got a free book uh, that you can all download. It's called Tech Variety. Just type in Tech Variety and you can get, I'll get it with 100 activities for teaching online. Uh, we need a lot of things, but teachers ramped up. K-12 teachers, higher ed teachers, corporate trainers, people were ramping up fast in March and April. And because of that, they can come back to those lesson plans and those ideas and those activities and that curriculum that they've designed that didn't work fully well and tweak it a little bit and refashion it a little bit and share it with someone else and move on. But they couldn't move on without having that. They needed that safe harbor. They needed some psychological safety to push into the area of blended or online learning environments. They have that now. And now they can build on that. And so the fascinating thing, the, the safety net's there for people, even though emotionally, psychologically, physically, economically, many things didn't work. And there are many frustrations along the way. But because of this pandemic, we got to push on and push into, a new er into new areas. And there's more research on online and distance learning in the past six months than in the past hundred years, you know? And so we'll continue to learn a lot from this. I'll, I should stop talking now, Chris or Young or... Dermot, you want to jump in? Um, I, I, I have another question then, and I suppose it's to do with uh, teacher innovation. And maybe, maybe this, this kind of tries to tie the four of you together, but maybe uh, hopefully you might argue your own, your own points individually as well. Um, if we say that the, the, the internal um, psychological processes which affect teachers change, one of them could be knowledge, one of them could be skills, one of them could be their capacity to innovate themselves. Is there any element that is more critical than the other? Well, in my view, I don't think that necessarily one is more or less important. I think uh, the, our show was really trying to highlight what has happened. And that Chris said, bring the innovations to a broader audience. What we've learned, you know, from my perspective, just happened to fit in my thinking. It's, it is really about um, a new model, a new paradigm of education where 
students should be driving their education. If you look today, and I want to highlight again, today's education is largely driven by top policy makers who create the curriculum standards, they create the assessments, then they're forcing a regional bureaucracies to force schools to implement them. Then you have school principals to make sure every teacher does it. They have teacher, you know, force students to memorize them. There's very little space for students. So, you know, uh, you know I think it was Chris, we're talking about Saracen talking about how students and teachers are the least powerful group of people in schools. And, but you look at education reforms at the same time, over the last 20, 30 years, there's not much improvement on achievement gaps or on excellence. We basically have failed our education reform. You know, if you look at the, the, the scale of improvement, it's sad. Does that mean technology has made no difference? Or our educational research has made no difference? All the education reform policies have made no difference? You know, what is going on? So I think it's the important thing is to, for me, is to build a different educational environment where students can truly take advantage of all the technology affords. Today's technology truly creates amazing things. You know, one thing you know, I, I always say, YouTube has made everybody's cooking much better in the qualities of, you know, of cooking. Everybody's making better food because of YouTube. Anyway, so let me turn let me turn the questions around a little bit. What is what's happening in Ireland that we should do an episode? <laughs> yeah, so I think um, so again, and, and I'm going to start off by talking about where we are in the the policy area, uh, which I suppose is young. You may you may you, you may be upset to uh, hear that, but we are we're in what's termed the pedagogical maturation phase, is is what it's been termed in the literature where the, the move is towards, we're, we're based around a couple of different frameworks. One is the UNESCO ICT CFT in Ireland. Then there's the digital strategy for schools and the digital learning framework. And I guess it's a move, as you guys have been talking about, from the traditional teacher-directed education with more of an emphasis on constructivist, socially constructivist, socio-cultural teaching and learning or educational use of technology at school. Um, that's where we are. Um, I suppose as, as young as you pointed out, maybe much of the data at the moment is not that flattering towards the investments and towards the potential behind ICT, which has been argued for in the literature. Um, but when you peel it back, I guess that there's still they're still what? They're still assessing the exact same skills as they have been for the last 20, 30 years. So maybe you wouldn't expect to have seen much, much change in that. But what is what is changing is the innovation, is that the, the capacity for teachers themselves to engage in bottom up change for the capacity for teachers themselves to be able to influence the system. And it's 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 step by step, I guess, at the moment. And um, you'd hope we're on the, the, the cusp of a, a revolution, uh, not a revolution as such, but certainly evolu well, evolution, revolution. I'm not too sure which is the correct term to use there, um, but certainly change is happening. And like even today's conference, some of the presenters, it's, it's, it's been very, very, very interesting, very, very humbling as well for, for many of us who maybe have been working in this sphere ourselves for the last five or 10 years. I just want to say some of you. Ireland is a very, very interesting place. You know, uh, you, were, you used to be the, uh, the chaotic tiger. You know, just think about all these changes. I, one thing, my view is that Ireland had, had the, followed the PISA too much. You should really get yourself out of the PISA uh, uh, scam and uh, not to do anything. Because you you have a yeah you, you have a very good place you've a very very interesting things can happen there and you've done a lot of work at your elementary school but I I think uh, you know as a small country there's no need to follow pizza so much so that's my advice. So I want to uh, actually build on something that Young spoke about about how YouTube has made people better cooks. I think there's something deeper there 
Um, so when I first moved to Arizona State, I was living by myself in this tiny apartment and I'm not a very good cook. The difference I found was going on the internet and looking up recipes versus looking up recipes in a book. When I look up a recipe in a book, it gives me one way of doing things. On the internet, if I went and looked, I would find like for a particular dish, I would find different people would have different ways of doing it. And that genuinely liberated me because it told me, oh, I don't have to just follow these instructions to the T. I can add this later or this before. Of course, I can't do whatever the heck I want because then the dish will be horrible. But there is a lot more flexibility here. And I think that that's a metaphor for silver lining for learning. It is not saying that the future is going to be one thing. The present is not one thing. The needs of a kid in Phoenix, Arizona are different from a kid need of a kid in Dublin, are different from a need of a kid in Nepal or in Bangladesh or in Zimbabwe, right? The context is different, the technologies are different, the social, cultural, linguistic, all of those things are different. And I think understanding that there are going to be many, many solutions. And I think that one of the mistakes we make is that we try to create this one system that is going to work for all. And I know Zao and I have been talking about what does it mean if we build a school for one, except that the one could be anybody. Like, can we do something like that? What does that even mean to ask that question? And I think that that's a question that's at the heart of this whole enterprise of education. It is about, it's, you know, this Ursula Le Guin has this great story about, you know, one who walk away from the Omelas. And, you know, which is about like how a, 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 a city takes all its pain and gives it to one person so that everybody else can lead, lead a happy life. And I think what we have done in education and in society and economics in general is we have disadvantaged whole groups of people in order to certain groups can have those benefits. And unless we ask ourselves those really difficult questions, and there was a great comment from, uh, I think, Tom um, on the YouTube chat making this point, and I just wanted to emphasize that. So I'm, as the host, I'm mindful of the time and the fact that we need to, uh, that the program will continue past when Silver Lining for Learning stops, because I know that you want to bring the conference to a close. And, you know, we're, we're happy to be part of that, but our episodes are an hour long. And so I do want to um, just say a couple of things in closing and then ask Kurt to talk about the next episode that's coming number 49. Uh, what I would say in closing is that um, one of the most fundamental things any organization can ask is what business are you in? Uh, I live about 90 miles north of a town in Rhode Island, Newport, Rhode Island, that has wonderful mansions that were built a century ago during what Mark Twain called the Gilded Age, uh, based on enormous fortunes in the railroad industry. And within 20 years of the time they were built, those fortunes had collapsed, the mansions were deserted, the Gilded Age was over. And the reason was that those people didn't understand what business they were in. They thought they were in the railroad business, but they were in the transportation business and the automobile and the airplane and hammered them. We are not anymore in the education business. We're not in the classroom business. We're not in the curriculum business. We're not in the teaching business, the testing business, uh, all that. We're in the lifelong learning business. And that's a really different business. That's more different than the automobile and the airplane were from the railroads. And if we don't get our act together, Somebody else will find a way to disrupt us, maybe for better, maybe for worse. Kurt, you want to talk about next week? I'd love to. And I put the episode in both uh, YouTube and in our Zoom channel. I put Brian's free book on hybrid flexible learning because we have Brian Beatty, the founder of High, of High Flex. He's a former student of mine actually here at Indiana University, now at San Fran State University. And Brian's gonna bring in two guests who are implementing HyFlex at a community college, Delgado Community College, Gene Samuel, and from Pierce College, a small private college near Philadelphia. Uh, he has Kathy Littlefield. And both of those people have chapters in his free book, one, one called One Size Fits None, and the other one fitting flexibly across the curriculum. So uh, 
we should have a real enjoyable show next time. I hope some of you can join us again at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's a little late in Ireland, but not too late. Uh, probably 10.30 or 11.30. I'm not sure the exact time. Uh, five hour difference? Five hours. Five hours. So 10.30 p.m. Uh, hope to see some of you there. It should be fun. Thank you.